Okay, yeah, let's start. Cool. Welcome, everyone. So thank you so much for coming. Um, here we have uh, Philip Lee, who is presenting on Introduction to MCMC for Infectious Diseases. Um, Philip is coming from UCLA originally, um, uh, educationally at least, um, where he did a bachelor's in computational and system biology and also a master's in bioinformatics. Um, at UCLA, he did research on the within post dynamics of SARS CoV 2 uh, infection in non human primates. And Philip is now a second year PhD student in uh, the Center for Computational Biology in Dr. Um, Lunard's lab. Um, and his current research interests are about finding ways to incorporate modern machine learning uh, into the workflows of traditional infectious disease modeling uh, approaches. So, super excited to hear your talk. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, we'll be recording this and putting on subtitles as well. And yeah, absolutely. Can take it away. Well, uh, thanks, Monica, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about modeling in the context of infectious diseases. And in particular, I'll be introducing the basic ideas behind Bayesian inference and Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC sampling. Uh, so the modeling techniques and strategies I'll be uh, discussing can be applied broadly to a wide variety of different contexts. Um, so even for those of you who aren't super interested in public health, I hope there will still be some useful ideas from the examples I uh, present today. Uh, so there's a very long history of people thinking about uh, disease transmission and how to understand these uh, processes. And one of the most popular types of mathematical models for infectious disease transmission um, are what are known as compartmental models. Um, so in a compartmental model, we have a population of individuals, and each individual belongs to a, a different compartment or class. So in a very simple model, we might just have three different classes. Uh, so this is an example of a very simple uh, SIR model with three compartments, uh, susceptible, infectious, and recovered. And this compartmental modeling framework, the people in our population can move between these different categories with different rates, uh, depending on how many people are in each of the categories. And the nice thing about these compartmental models is that, uh, and the reason why they're so popular, is that there's a very standard way to convert a graphical schematic like this into a set of uh, differential equations. So once you have a set of equations like this, we can solve them numerically to see what the transmission dynamics look like. Um, so in the plot on the right here, I chose some values for the model rate parameters, and I just simulated the dynamics forward in time. Um, but a more realistic example of a problem we might face could look something like this. Uh, instead of starting off with a mathematical model, we are first given epidemiological data. Uh, for example, we might have data on the number of new disease cases over time. Uh, then using this data, we want to fit some kind of mathematical model, which could be a compartmental model. And the challenge now is to find parameter values for our model that can describe the patterns that we see in our observed data. So how can I determine values of my model parameters that are compatible with the observed data? And once we fit transmission model to data, uh, there are lots of things that we can do to analyze the fitted model to help inform prevention and control measures. Um, for example, we can evaluate potential uh, you know, intervention measures, uh, such as vaccines or uh, masking. And we can also use the fitted model to try to forecast how many infections we expect to see in the future. Uh, so that's the overall motivation for doing this type of disease modeling and for fitting these types of mathematical transmission models. And today we'll be going over a Bayesian approach to do this type of model fitting. Uh, so before we go into specific examples, we first need to talk about the basic mechanics of doing Bayesian inference. And we don't have a lot of time, so I'll be going through this part pretty quickly. But if you're interested in getting more into the weeds of Bayesian statistics, I highly recommend this book, Statistical Rethinking. Um, I think it's a really great introduction to applied modeling, and it has a lot of nice examples that demonstrate the uh, strengths of the Bayesian approach. Okay, so let's first very quickly go over the components of a Bayesian analysis, and then I'll go through a simple example to make these ideas more concrete. Uh, so first we have some observed data. This could be something like the number of new infections we see each day, and I'll denote this data as D. And the next thing we need is a probability model that describes how the observed data is generated. And our probability model is parameterized by some set of parameters theta, 
And we need to be able to compute the probability of, of observing our data for every possible data value. Um, and the last step is actually fitting the probability model, uh, which means finding theta values that have high probability given our observed data. So we want the probability of theta given our data, D, to be very large, which means finding parameter values that are highly plausible given our data. So in order to find these highly plausible thetas, we can apply the conditional rules of probability. Um, specifically, we can use Bayes' rule to help us compute these uh, plausibilities. Um, and each component of Bayes' rule has a name. Uh, the probability of theta is called the prior probability. Uh, this is a distribution that describes our prior beliefs on what theta parameter values we think are most plausible. Uh, the probability of D given theta is called the likelihood, and the form of the likelihood is determined by our probability model. Uh, the denominator, probability of D, is just a normalizing constant. Um, and the probability of theta given D is called the posterior probability. So at a high level, this is what Bayesian inference is all about. We start off with some prior belief about what we think are reasonable values for our uh, model parameters. Um, that prior belief information is encoded in the prior probability term. Then we are given data D, and we can update our prior beliefs by multiplying the prior to the likelihood. So multiplying the prior by the uh, likelihood gives us the posterior distribution, uh, the probability of theta given D. And the posterior probability term tells us which theta values are most plausible, taking into account both our prior knowledge and also the information contained in our data, which is the likelihood. So this process of updating our prior with observed data to get the posterior is called Bayesian updating. Okay, so um, let's work through a simple example to make these ideas more concrete. And this is an example from the Statistical Rethinking book. Um, so the problem we have is this. We want to estimate the proportion of the Earth that is covered in water. Uh, and the approach we'll take is the following. We'll take a globe of the Earth, toss it into the air, and then catch it. And then we'll look at our index finger and record whether it's touching water or land. Uh, so let's say we toss the globe nine times. And for six of those tosses, our index finger ends up touching water. And for three of those times, our index finger ends up touching land. So uh, now given this observed data, how can we figure out a good estimate for the proportion of the earth that is covered in water? Uh, so more formally, here's our problem setup. We have observed data D, which is the number of waters and lands we observe after tossing the globe a bunch of times. And assuming our tosses are independent, a uh, reasonable choice for a probability model is that the number of waters we observe is a binomial random variable, where the probability of our index finger touching water is equal to the proportion of the planet that's covered in water. Um, so now we can use Bayesian updating to figure out which proportions P are most plausible given our observed data. So applying Bayes' rule gives us this equation, uh, which is the probability of um, the probability of a certain proportion P given we observe W waters is equal to the probability of uh, W waters given P times the probability of P divided by the probability of W. Um, and since the denominator the probability of W is just a normalizing constant that doesn't depend on P. We can ignore it for now and just say the posterior distribution of P is proportional to the data likelihood times the prior distribution of P. Um, okay, so now we need to write down our data likelihood, which is given by the binomial distribution. And we need a prior distribution. And for simplicity, we'll just use a uniform prior for the proportion of water P. Um, so this type of prior uh, is a type of prior where we basically don't assume any value of our parameters more likely than any other uh, value, and that's what we call a uniform prior. And I won't go into much detail about this here, but in general, uniform priors are a bad idea. Uh, we almost always have some kind of domain knowledge that can help us eliminate uh, totally unreasonable parameter values. Um, but in any case, these are all of the ingredients we need to do our Bayesian inference. And this problem is simple enough that we can uh, compute analytically the exact posterior distribution. Um, but for many real world problems, it might be impossible to write down the exact equation. So we need to approximate these calculations numerically uh, with programming. Um, so I'll move over to R now to demonstrate this. 
Okay, so the first thing we need to do is define a range of p-values for the modeling process to consider. Uh, so let's define a sequence of p-values from zero to one. Okay, so, so the variable p grid here contains uh, 50 different p-values from zero to one. Okay, now let's define our prior distribution. Uh, we are assuming a uniform prior, so each of the 50 p-values um, all have the same prior value. So I'll just set that to uh, I'll just set um, all the prior values to one. Let me take a look at the prior values. See, they're all equal to one. Um, and the last thing we need to do is to compute the likelihood for each p-value. So our observed data is uh, six waters and three lands. So we need to calculate the probability of, of observing this data for every p-value in p-grid. And easy way to do this in R is to just use the binomial density function. Uh, so, so that's how you can compute the binomial binomial likelihood values for every value of p in p grid. Okay, so now that we have both our prior and likelihood. Computing the posterior is super easy. All we need to do is multiply the likelihood and the prior together. Okay, so that's how I got our posterior. Um, and we also need to normalize the posterior values so that we end up with actual probabilities. Um, so to do that, we just divide all the posterior values um, by normalizing constant, which is just the sum of all the posterior values. Right. So what's your p grid here? P grid is just the discrete sequence of uh, p values that we want to consider for possible proportions of water that they're discovered by. Um, so p grid. Uh, it's just a bunch of values from zero to one spaced evenly. Um, so this is a discrete set of p-values. Uh, if you want our posterior to be smoother, we can choose more. Uh, we can choose a smaller interval for the um, p-grid. Um, but for something simple like this, 50 values is good enough. Um, OK, so now that we have our posterior, we can uh, plot it to see what that looks like. I'll label me axes. Okay, so, um, Uh, this is what our posterior distribution looks like. And it looks like, uh, according to our Bayesian updating, the most likely p-value is somewhere around 0 0.65. Um, okay, I'll go back to the slides now. Okay, so graphically, here's what's happening with the Bayesian updating. Uh, we start off with our prior distribution, which is uniform. And again, this is saying that before we see our data, we are assuming each proportion P of water is equally likely to be true. Then we update our prior belief by multiplying it to data likelihood, which gives us our posterior distribution. And the nice thing about Bayesian updating and Bayesian inference is that the posterior distribution contains everything we need to do our downstream analysis. So this final posterior distribution is the answer to our inference problem. 
It incorporates all of the uncertainty from our prior distribution and updates that with information from our data using the likelihood. Uh, so again, the entire posterior distribution is the Bayesian estimate. And there are lots of things we can extract from this posterior distribution estimate. Uh, so we can extract point estimates. For example, we can find the parameter value that has the highest posterior probability. Um, this estimate is called the MAP estimate, which stands for uh, the maximum a posteriori estimate. And for our globe tossing problem, the MAP estimate is somewhere around 0 0.6 and 0 0.7. Um, and these points, point estimates are fine, but by themselves, they aren't great because they don't account for all of the uncertainty information that is contained in the posterior. So one way that we can communi communicate this uncertainty is by using uh, something called credible intervals. Um, so for example, a 95% credible interval is the range of parameter values that contain the central 95% of the probability mass of our posterior distribution. And these credible interval, intervals serve a similar role as confidence intervals in traditional, uh, traditional statistics. And another really powerful way that we can use the posterior is to perform downstream posterior simulations. So the posterior distribution tells us the probability of every parameter value. So when we do simulations using these parameter values, we can weight our simulation results based on the posterior probabilities. Um, and I'll show an example of this later on with uh, the SIR model. Uh, so the posterior distribution is really great. It contains a lot of useful information about our parameter values, um, but often it's difficult to work directly with our posterior. Um, it's usually easier to work with samples from the posterior. So basically we want to approximate our posterior estimate with the histogram. Um, and I'll demonstrate how you can get this histogram approximation um, in R and why it's convenient to work with these samples, uh, work with samples from the posterior. Um, okay. Uh, so R has a very convenient sampling function that will let us sample p-values in proportion to their posterior probabilities. Uh, so we want to get a bunch of uh, p samples, and we'll sample from our original probability grid um, with probabilities according to our posterior. And let's say we sample uh, 10,000 values. Okay. Sample of replacement. Okay, let's plot a histogram of the sample values. Uh, so this is one way that we can get a sample of p-values to approximate our true posterior. And once we have these samples, we can extract estimates from it. Uh, so for example, we can find the median p-value using the quantile function. Uh, Okay, so we find that the median sampled p-value is around 0 0.65. Um, and we can also get credible intervals for our posterior distribution using these samples, also using the quantile function. And uh, we see the 95% credible interval is around 0 0.35 to 0 0.88. Um, so take home message here is that if we can get parameter value samples from our posterior distribution, then we can really easily get the sum that describe our posterior. Um, so that's all I want to talk about for background Bayesian inference. Um, before we move on, are there any questions about anything I've presented? Is there a better way to, to, um, to, to, to use the prior to 
Yeah, so that's a very uh, important topic in Bayesian settings is we have to make a decision about the form for the prior distribution. And um, in this case, you can see, okay, the final proportion of water that we estimate, the 95% credible interval goes from 0.35 to 0.88, which, uh, you know, if you've been on this planet for a while, you probably know is not a very good estimate. We know that the most of the planet is covered in water, yet we have so much probability mass that's less than 0.5. So in this example, one way that we can have a, um, you know, a smarter prior is we can have a uniform prior, but we set uh, the prior probability values to zero for everything less than 0.5. And they'll have the effect of cutting off uh, the posterior distribution at um, values less than 0.5. And uh, you know, in other settings, there are better ways that you can specify more informative priors also. Um, and uh, yeah, but that's a big, um, uh, very important thing to consider for Bayesian inference. And it's actually, uh, I think one of the strengths of Bayesian inference is that you can encode lots of different types of prior information depending on what distribution you choose for the prior. Um, so yeah, I hope that's helpful. Um, okay, so now let's move on to an example of an inference problem for a disease transmission model. Uh, so let's say we observe a bunch of new infections over time. Uh, what can we learn from this data? And the first step when doing infectious disease modeling is picking the form uh, for our model. Uh, then depending on the model, we can get different insights into the transmission process or use the model to make predictions and test out uh, hypothetical interventions. Uh, so data I'm sharing here is a bit more complicated than the example I showed earlier with a simple SIR model. Um, so here it seems like we might have some kind of uh, periodic pattern of disease outbreaks with multiple peaks in new cases. And one way that we can account for this pattern is by including demographic processes into our compartmental model, adding births and deaths into the compartments. So the idea is that after the initial outbreak, the system runs out of susceptible individuals, so another outbreak can't get going. Um, but if we include births such that the number of susceptible individuals gets replenished over time, then this enables the possibility of multiple outbreaks once the number of susceptibles reaches a critical number to enable um, the disease is spread again rapidly. Um, okay, so now that we have this model, what are some useful things that we can learn from it if we fit it to uh, data? Um, well, one of the most important parameters in epidemiology is called the basic reproductive number, or R0. And R0 is defined as the average number of secondary cases uh, that an infectious individual would generate in a completely susceptible population. And this is a number that people care a lot about because it uh, is kind of an indicator of whether disease, uh, a disease outbreak is growing or shrinking, depending on whether R0 is greater than or less than one. Um, so going back to our differential equation model, we can actually compute analy analytically what the R0 value for the system should be. And okay, so we now have all the pieces we need to perform a Bayesian inference analysis on R0. We have observed data, which is new cases over time. We have a probability model based on our ODE compartmental model. Uh, for this example, I'm going to assume the observed cases are Poisson distributed around the case trajectories predicted by the ODE model, um, but you can use other distributions also. And the observed data and probability model combined tells us how to compute the likelihood which is the probability of the observed data um, for any given R0 value. And the last thing we need to specify is a prior distribution for R0. Um, so that's our overall goal. We want to use the observed data to try and figure out what the R0 value is for this disease, um, given the probability model that we have selected. Um, so to do Bayesian inference, we need to compute the posterior distribution. And if you recall from our globe tossing example, the way we calculated the posterior is we first chose a list of p-values to consider. Uh, 
Uh, we then computed the prior and likelihood for every p-value and multiply them together to get the posterior value. And this technique of discretizing our range of parameter values and then manually computing all the individual posterior probabilities is called grid approximation. And it works really well for simple examples such as the globe tossing problem. And uh, we might initially try to do something similar with R0 values in our transmission model where we generate a discrete list of R0 values and then compute the posterior probability for every R0 value. And uh, in this case, this is actually possible, and I'll go through some code to show how we can do this. Um, but in this case, grid approximation might not be the best approach because the likelihood values become extremely small when we have a lot of data. So it can be very challenging numerically to work with these probability values. Uh, so grid approximation isn't always the most numerically stable approach. Um, but the real reason why we need something better than grid approximation in general is when our models become uh, high-dimensional, grid approximation uh, completely fails. Um, in most real settings, we have many more parameters, and the grid approximation quickly becomes computationally uh, infeasible. So we need some other approach to approximate the posterior. Um, but before we get into that, I want to show you how we can use grid approximation to find the R0 posterior distribution. OK, um, so the first thing we need to do is to read in our data. I uh, save these data in a CSV file here. And I will share all the coding examples um, on the seminar website so you can take a look at it afterwards if you're interested. Um, and we can extract the observed cases and plot them. So this is the same data I showed on the slides. Uh, and the next thing we need to do is to code up our ODE model. So there's a pretty standard way to do this type of ODE modeling in R. I won't go into the details of how to do this exactly right now, but if you're interested, you can look at the code afterwards. Um, but for now, all you need to know is that this is just a function that um, this is just a function that encodes the differential equations for our SIR model. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to define our prior function. And again, to make things simple, I'm just going to use a uniform prior for R0. Find a prior function for R0. And we'll restrict our R0 values between uh, one and three. Okay. Yeah. Um, as you have like a derived compartment, is that like a cumulative incident? Like, I guess, is there like a reason why you have that included for later, or is it just like how you just did it? Yeah, so this is kind of a bookkeeping trick for getting these uh, incidence trajectories. Um, so we have an I compartment to keep track of infections, but the problem with that is that usually the I compartment keeps track of the total number of infections over time, but the data we get is the number of new infections each day. So what this Y compartment do, is doing is it's keeping track of the cumulative number of infections. And to get these uh, daily incidence trajectories, you just take the differences between the cumulative infections each day. Um, so yeah, this Y compartment here is just uh, for convenience for helping compute the um, case trajectories. Um, something else that is commonly done is people won't have a Y compartment like this, and they'll, once they solve the ODE numerically, they will recompute all the force of infection terms to get the number of new infections each day. Um, but yeah, this is just for getting the case trajectories. Um, okay, so for our 
Um, okay, so again, in general, it's bad to use uniform non-informative priors because we will almost always have some kind of information about our about our system. Um, so, for example, maybe we know from you know previous outbreaks what the R naught value should be for a pathogen like this. So we can you know choose priors that are centered over more reasonable R naught values. Um, but just to keep things easy, I'm going to use a uniform prior right now. Um, and an important thing to note here is that I'm taking the log, um, the log prior probabilities. And you know the reason we need to do this is because our likelihood values later become really small. So taking the logarithm helps with numerical stability. Okay, so we have our prior function. Now we need to write down a likelihood function. Um, and I don't have time to go into all the details here right now, but there are just two main things we need to do to compute the likelihood numerically. The first thing is given an R naught value, we need to solve our ODE system. And that's done using the standard um, ODE solving function in R. And then using our ODE solution, we need to extract the predicted number of observed cases and then compute a Poisson likelihood using our actual observed data. Um, so if you're interested in the details, you can take a closer look at this afterwards. Um, but again, it's important that we compute uh, log probabilities because otherwise we'll run into numerical issues with um, tiny probability values. So that's all the difficult stuff out of the way. We have our prior and likelihood. So to compute our posterior, all we need to do is to multiply the prior to the likelihood. And I'll write a function for that. And since we're working with log probabilities, the log posterior is just the sum of the log likelihood and the log prior. Now we're ready to do our grid approximation for R0. So let's set up, set up a grid of R0 values from uh, 1 to 3. Okay. And we can compute the log posterior probability for every R0 value. Um, and I'll do that using one of R's uh, Y functions, which applies uh, our posterior, which will apply our posterior function to every R naught value in our grid of R naught values. Okay. Um, and so our R0 posterior right now contains our log probability values, but what we want are the actual probabilities. So to get the actual probabilities, all we need to do is take the exponential of the log probabilities. Um, and again, the last thing we need to do is we need to normalize our posterior value so that we have a probability distribution. Okay. And let's plot these. Plot the posterior. Okay, so you can see that our posterior distribution for on R0 is very peaked, um, which indicates that our Bayesian modeling process is very confident that the R0 value is somewhere around 1.8. Um, so this seemed like it worked pretty well, but um, like I said earlier, this isn't the most numerically stable approach of doing things. 
And in most real world examples, this kind of grid approximation um, isn't possible. So. Okay, so this finally brings us to the title of this talk, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC. Um, if you remember from the globe tossing example, instead of working with the grid approximated posterior, it was much easier working with samples from the posterior distribution. So if we have these samples, we can find things like the median, quantiles, and credible intervals for our posterior. And this is part of the motivation behind MCMC algorithms. Uh, MCMC algorithms are used to obtain samples from the posterior without ever computing the actual posterior distribution. So these are very powerful algorithms and extremely useful in practice because most of the time we can't compute the actual posterior distribution, usually because of problems with high dimensionality and when grid approximation fails. Um, so I'll repeat this again because it's uh, such an important concept. Uh, MCMC algorithms let us obtain samples from the posterior without the need to actually compute the posterior. Um, so to understand how these algorithms work, we first need to talk briefly about Markov chains. Um, so Markov chains are just a sequence of random variables where the value of the next variable only depends on the value of the current variable. Uh, so I have a simple example here that keeps track of the uh, a Markov chain of the weather over time. Uh, so maybe the first day is sunny, the second day is rainy, um, and so on. And this is a Markov chain where the possible states the variables can take are either sunny or rainy. And another way that we can represent um, this Markov chain is with a graph like this, where we track the state of the Markov chain over time. And we can keep track of this Markov chain for many days and uh, keep track of how long our Markov chain spends at each of the states. Uh, so in this example, maybe our Markov chain is sunny 80% of the time and rainy 20% of the time. And the way we find these proportions is by running the chain forward for a really long time and then just counting up how often each of these two states happen. Um, so now applying Markov chains to our inference problems, instead of running a chain over possible weather values, we want our chain to take on parameter values. So for our globe tossing example, we have one parameter, P, um, which is the proportion of Earth that is water. And our Markov chain could look something like this. Uh, we start off at uh, p equals 0 0.7, then the next time step, our chain jumps to p equals 0 0.4, and then to p equals 0 0.6, and then p equals 0 0.5. And uh, similar to the weather uh, example, we can keep track of the parameter value p in our Markov chain over time. And uh, the amazing thing about these Markov chain Monte Carlo methods is that if we design the way we jump between these parameter values in a clever way, then after running the Markov chain for a really long time and keeping track of all the sampled parameter values along the way, we'll eventually end up with a sample of parameter values that are in proportion to their true posterior probabilities. Uh, so the most popular MCMC algorithm used today is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. Uh, so this algorithm constructs a Markov chain that gives us parameter samples that match our posterior distribution. Um, there's actually some interesting history behind the development of this algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is named after Nicholas Metropolis, who is the first author of the paper where this algorithm was first described. Um, but there's actually some controversy over who deserves credit for the actual algorithm development. Um, so I don't have time to talk about it right now, but I think it's important to recognize all the people that are involved in developing this algorithm, especially considering how uh, widely used it is today. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the slide talking about the implementation of the, or the details of the Metropolis algorithm, but um, these will be posted online so you can take a look afterwards. And uh, yeah, I'll move over to the R coding again to show how we can implement MCMC sampling for our transmission model. <laughs> 
Okay, so there are actually a lot of um, existing R and, and Python packages for doing MCMC sampling, but I think it's a good exercise to at least code up an MCMC sample from scratch at least once. So I'll show you how to do that uh, right now. Um, so the first part of the code is exactly the same as what we had in the grid approximation. We need to be able to compute the likelihood in prior. Um, so I'll run this code. So this is the same as we had before for computing the prior likelihood and posterior distributions. And to do MCMC sampling, we need to define a function that will pick a new parameter value based on our current parameter value in our Markov chain. And there are lots of, um, and the, the, this, uh, the function for choosing a new parameter value is called the proposal function. And there are lots of ways that you can specify this, but one common way of proposing new parameters is a sample of the new value from a uh, normal distribution. So this is what that looks like. Okay, so all this function does is it samples uh, a new parameter value from a normal distribution centered over our current R0 value. How do you choose this the standard deviation? Yeah, so this is something that needs to be tuned. Okay. And in the you know professionally developed MCMC sampling, there's a lot of work behind the scenes on kind of running the chain initially and seeing whether the chain is behaving in a good way and they'll automatically tune the step size for you. But um, usually what, if you're doing something like this, you will create your proposal function, run your MCMC chain and see whether or not the chain is exploring the parameter space well. If it's not, then you might need to decrease the step size um, if it's uh, you know bouncing around too wildly mm -hmm. or if it's not exploring it fast enough, you might need to increase the step size. So that's something you have to tune um, manually if you're doing it this way. Uh, the most modern uh, packages that are available will do this automatically for you. Okay, so we have all the components we need now to do our MCMC sampling, and I'll define a function to do this. Uh, so the R0 argument here is will be our starting parameter yeah. value, and iterations will be how long we run the chain for. And the first thing we need to do is to uh, initialize the Markov chain. Um, so um, we'll just make an empty vector to store parameter values. And we can assign our uh, initial R0 value to the first entry of the chain. Okay. Uh, so next up is to actually simulate the Markov chain forward in time. And we'll do that with a uh, for loop. Um, so at each iteration, we first extract our current R0 value. And um, windows open here right now. Um, we first extract our current R0 value, and then um, we'll use that current value to propose a new R0 value. So we'll do this with the proposal function we just wrote. Um, okay, and then using the new R0 value and the current R0 value, we can compute a probability of transitioning to the new R0 value. Um, and due to interest of finishing on time, I won't go into too much detail about this right now, but you can look at the slides afterwards for details on. Um, uh, why we compute the jump probabilities this way. Uh, 
Um, so as very quickly, we computed probability of transitioning to our uh, new R0 value, depending on, which depends on uh, the posterior value of the new R0 value and the posterior value of the current R0 value. Um, and then we use that probability to determine whether or not we move our chain to the new R0 value or stay at our current R0 value in the Markov chain. Um, okay. And then return the chain at the end. Well, I might have gotten messed up, so I'll just uh, bring my emergency back up here and copy any function. The idea is you're not always updating. You want the chain to tend to move to areas of the tend to move to parameter values with high posterior probability, but you also want to be able to explore the entire distribution. So it'll still sometimes walk to areas of the parameter space with low posterior probability. And that's why we have this kind of weird probability rule for jumping to new probability or parameter values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so let's start the chain running here. And um, while that's running, let's take a few seconds to finish. Uh, the decision of where we start our chain is sometimes pretty important. Um, here, maybe, uh, I know that the R0 values shouldn't be much larger than two or three. So I'll start sampling the chain um, at the value of three here. Um, and another thing that's very commonly done is people will run multiple chains in parallel, starting at different parameter values. And if everything is working properly, the chains will uh, should all mix together and overlap over time, regardless of what starting parameter values uh, you choose. So that's a pretty good way of diagnosing whether or not the MCMC sampling has any problems. Maybe it's a little slower because I'm uh, running a lot of things on my computer right now. So I'll just move over. I'll move back to the slides where I have uh, the results. Okay. Um, so once the chain is done running, we can plot the parameter value the chain is at over time. And this is called a trace plot. So this is exactly the same type of plot. Um, this is exactly the same type of plot uh, I showed earlier on the slides here, um, except we're running the chain for thousands of steps. Um, and something you might notice from looking at this trace plot is that um, we start the chain at an R0 value of three, but then it quickly moves around and settles down to this area around R0 of 1.8 and 2. And this initial noisy phase is what's often called the burn-in phase. And it's very noisy because the Markov chain hasn't quite settled into its stationary distribution yet. Um, so before analyzing samples from this chain, uh, we need to remove samples from this initial sampling phase. And that's what I have on the right here. Um, and looking at, uh, uh, you see, after removing the burn-in samples, we have a much a uh, nicer looking spread of sample parameter values. Um, and you'll sometimes hear the phrase uh, carry caterpillar. Uh, so if your MCMC trace plot looks something like this, then you should be happy. Um, if it doesn't look like this, you can try adjusting your step size or try different proposal functions. Um, but in practice, there are lots of uh, professionally developed MCMC samplers that do a lot of step size tuning for you. Um, so we can also plot a histogram of our MCMC sampled R0 values, and we can see that 
uh, you know, the samples are very highly concentrated around 1.8 or 1.9. And, uh, you know, the MCMC sample values match the grid approximated posterior really well, as an example. And the last thing I want to show is what I mentioned earlier about doing posterior simulations. So the MCMC samples we obtain embody all of the uncertainty in our posterior estimate. And if we want to do posterior simulations, we can propagate that uncertainty through to our simulations uh, simply by using uh, MCMC or MCMC samples to do simulations. So this is what that looks like. Um, so upon the right here, I extracted a subset of our MCMC sample parameter values. And for each sample, um, our NOD value, I compute the um, trajectory from the ODE model and overlaid it onto our observed data. And that's what that looks like. So the circles are observed data and each of the 100 um, and this kind of cloud of red case trajectories is the implied case trajectory from our posterior distribution. And a uh, nice thing about these types of simulations is that we can also do that using our prior distribution. So the plot on the left here is showing what happens if we sample R0 values from our prior distribution and then compute the trajectories using those values. So this kind of shows us what we're assuming about what R0 values are plausible before we give our model data. So the prior is the, or the left is the prior case trajectories. And after the model sees data, we get these posterior predicted trajectories. Um, so um, and in this case, it seems like the model fitting worked pretty well with all the uh, trajectories, track the data really nicely. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to share for today. I know that was a lot of information. So if you're interested in learning more about this material, I highly recommend the statistical rethinking book. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to take any final questions. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks.